Well, th thank you very much, Patricia. That's very kind of you. Um, the last time I gave this talk, I'm going to have to move fairly fast because we want to leave a little time for questions, but a journalist, well-known journalist in the audience said he learned more about ancient history than he did about mathematics. Because I'm going to start with Alexander the Great. Um, and I don't know whether you know about him. I mean, when I went to school, we never learned that sort of history. Um, but a remarkable uh, guy who was very keen on scholarly work. I mean, he had Aristotle as his tutor. And um, when he was 20 years old, his father was assassinated, his father the king, and he had to put down revolts and things. And yet within two years, he had got together an army of different Greek states and crossed Asia Minor, over into Asia Minor, to, to, to beat the Persians. Remember, the Persians had earlier sort of attacked um, Greece. Uh, the Battle of Thermopylae is a, a famous one, which will be 2,500 years um, anniversary in 2021. And uh, that's the place where 300 Spartans died to the last man to defend Europe from the invading armies of the Persians. The Persians had a fantastic empire. And Alexander conquered the whole empire. Now, you see why I'm saying this in a minute. See, first of all, he's, he, was, he became king of Macedon, but very soon he became king of Egypt because Egypt was part of the Persian Empire. And even before he'd conquered the whole Persian Empire, he took Egypt. And there are many interesting stories uh, involved there. Um, but eventually, a couple of years later, he took uh, the whole Persian Empire and became the great king of Persia. And he died a young man. I mean, I think, what, what was his age? Um, 32 when he died. After his death, his generals divided the empire between them, and the person who took over Egypt was his general Ptolemy, later known as Ptolemy Sota. The reason he's known as Ptolemy Sota, he's also known as Ptolemy the First because there were lots of Ptolemies. Um, one, two, three, four, five, six, you know. The Rosetta Stone is Ptolemy V, um, and uh, those who uh, have been to the opera of Giulio Cesare will, uh, will uh, meet uh, Ptolemy the Thirteenth. You know, there are lots of these Ptolemies. Um, uh, and eventually the dynasty uh, collapsed with Cleopatra, but that's another story. Ptolemy Sota was called Saviour, Ptolemy Saviour, because he saved the island of Rhodes from an invasion by the king of Cyprus. And um, they gave him the title Saviour. Uh, and they built a huge monument there called the Colossus of Rhodes, which exists no more, one of the great seven wonders of the world, even after it had collapsed, which happened fairly shortly after it was built, actually. It was still one of the great wonders of the world. Ptolemy, we think it's Ptolemy the first who founded the great library of Alexandria where Euclid worked. We, don't know, we know about Ptolemy, we know about Alexander, we know about all these sort of famous generals and, and, and kings and so on. We know absolutely nothing about Euclid. I mean, we don't know where he was born, we don't know when he was born, we don't know the circumstances of his death, we don't know when he died. Um, there's a famous quote here that I put uh, when the king asked him if he could, you know, give a sort of neat explanation of his geometry. He said, there are no royal roads to geometry. And, you know, the idea of royal roads existed at that time. Put in Persia, there were royal roads that were only available to the king and his entourage and so on. Um, we have no idea who this guy was. He may have been quite a young man, and he may simply have disappeared, or maybe he didn't exist at all. I think he probably did exist. Anyway, he wrote this thing called Elements, uh, Euclid's Elements, and um, they were, let us move on to those, uh, composed in 13 books. Um, he th this is really extraordinary stuff because what, it's the greatest textbook of all time. What he did was he sort of laid out everything. He laid out definitions, he laid out 
postulates, five important axioms um, for plain geometry. And it was written using, if you've ever done math, any sort of serious mathematics, and people always used to do this in, in school at one time. It doesn't happen anymore. They all used to. They used to do Euclidean geometry. And they would, they would prove lemmas and theorems, you know? Um, wonderful, uh, wonderful for the brain and, and development of, of, uh, of, our, of our brains to do that. I'm, I'm very sad it doesn't, isn't done uh, as much as it is um, as it was today. Uh, but what were these five postulates? Um, we'll come to that in a minute. But the elements were transmitted. Um, well, they got translated into Arabic. Here's how they came to Europe. They got translated into Arabic. Um, a chap called um, uh, Adelard of Bath went uh, to Spain, got hold of a copy, and then translated it into Latin. Um, and this Latin translation, I've mentioned Roger Bacon, who was one of the great minds of this country in the 13th century, not to be confused with Francis Bacon. Um, the first translation from Greek directly into Latin was in 1505. And what I've pictured here is the English edition in 1570, uh, made by um, Henry Billingsley, who became Lord Mayor of London, died in 1606. It contains, it's, it's difficult to read this writing actually, but um, it's, it says that there is a preface by M.I.D. M.I.D. is John D., Dr. John D., who was pretty much, I think, in charge of the Elizabethan Secret Service and decoding of messages, which, of course, led to the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, as many of you who have studied uh, that period of history will know. And um, the English National Opera, that's, you were kind enough to mention the fact that I'm interested in opera, are putting on an opera called Dr. D pretty soon. Um, so uh, I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, it's a new opera. Now, let us go to the five postulates, because that's really what this talk is about. You see, I've got the first four pr pretty simple. There's a line between any two points. You can extend a line in both directions. Uh, if you've got two points, you can use one as the center of a cir circle, and the other one to measure the radius, and then you can draw a circle with that center and that radius. All right angles are equal. Right angle means 90 degrees in our usual terminology uh, uh, acquired from the Babylonians. But just call them right angles. You know, you take a straight line, you put a perpendicular there. This angle is the same as that angle, and they're 90 degrees. But then there's the fifth axiom. Uh, you can read it here, and you probably read it and say, oh, I'm not sure I've quite got that. So why don't I um, give you a picture? That's the picture. So these lines, L and M, are sort of, so to speak, not parallel. You see the sum of these two angles, alpha and beta, is less than 180 degrees. And in that circumstance, the axiom is that these two lines, L and M, will meet. That's an axiom. And he, when Euclid wrote his elements, he, he tried to prove as much as he could without using that axiom. But eventually, he had to, you know, he went so far with his theorems that eventually he needed this axiom. And many people since then wanted to get rid of this axiom. They felt it wasn't really necessary. Um, I'm only going to mention a few of these people. Uh, we'll go, first of all, to a chap called Alhazen. He's sometimes uh, pronounced Alhazen. Uh, also known as al-Basri because he came from Basra, uh, died in Cairo. Um, famous work on optics, which again, you know, Roger Bacon quoted Alhazen's work on optics. It was brilliant stuff. At one time, and this is complete digression, you know, but at one time, um, people used to believe that the eyes sort of sent out rays that came... Well, it's all very complicated, what, what they used to think. But this guy had the right idea that it was just light coming in straight lines and entering our eyes. You think, well, that's pretty obvious. But, you know, it hadn't been obvious to an awful lot of people. And he did marvelous work on refraction and so on. Now, he also worked on the parallel postulate. Um, 
and tried to prove it. But here's another famous man who said, well, Al Hazen just got this wrong. And that was Omar Khayyam. Omar Khayyam is often remembered as a poet, the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. Uh, but in fact, he was even better as a, as a mathematician and an astronomer. And he criticized Al Hazen's proof. Um, I'll tell you what Al Hazen's proof was. I'll just do it. He took a straight line, and he took a little perpendicular line of a certain length, and he moved that perpendicular line, keeping it perpendicular to the straight line, like that. And the point at the top of that would draw another line, and this would obviously be, you know, sort of, so to speak, parallel to the first line, and you just put... But Omar Khayyam said, this is nonsense. This really is nonsense. And um, it is nonsense, actually. Um, the idea of having points move uh, is okay. I remember when my son was doing a brilliant geometry course at school, he explained a proof to me where points moved along here and another point moved along there and so on, and his teacher said, no, no, this is not quite wrong. But uh, he insisted it was right, and I, I examined this proof in some detail and said, if you just rephrase it, and he did, went back to his teacher, and the teacher said, that's good, which shows he had a good teacher. Some teachers wouldn't do that but uh, excellent teacher. Anyway, uh, to jump forward to the 17th century, well, actually the 18th century, to uh, an Italian mathematician called Girolamo Sacheri uh, thought he had proved Euclid's fifth axiom. In other words, he thought he could prove it from the other four more basic axioms. And he split into three cases where triangles, uh, the angles of a triangle added to less or more or exactly 180 degrees. And then he had to eliminate the first two cases. And he published this in a book, which came out, if you read the date on here, um, I think there is a date on it somewhere, isn't there? Yes, right down there at the bottom, you see, um, in Roman numerals, 1733. That was the year he died. Bit of a shame, really, because it was wrong. Uh, but he, ne nevertheless, these people were very clever people. I just you know, say they, even they got it wrong. Um, so I'm going to give you a false proof. I'll tell you it's false before we start. But, you know, you can try and figure out what's wrong with this if you, if you can. First of all, the first step is to show that any three points lie on a straight line or a circle. So let me just run through that very quickly. Um, I'm just taking two of the points there, and I'm drawing a circle through those two points. And the the red dot is the center of the circle. Okay? Now we want to make the circle, we can make the circle smaller, we can make it bigger. Uh, here's um, a case of making it smaller, and here is a case of making it bigger. And it just needs to get a little bit bigger, um, and it'll hit the third point. In this animation, actually, it does hit the third point. <laughs> Curiously enough, when I actually do it um, in the talk, it doesn't, but never mind. Um, <laughs> well, I think it's rather good, actually. It doesn't, doesn't quite get there. Um, all right. So if you're holding on to your seats, we're going to really go into this proof that two lines are going to intersect. Now, let me just remind you of Euclid's fifth axiom. You've got these lines L and M. The angles between the angles that they make with a third line add up to less than 180. And the idea is to prove that L and M must intersect. Okay, so I'm going to do that. I'm going to do it in front of your eyes, and then we'll move on to some more history. So if you get fed up with this mathematics, it's okay. We'll, we'll, we'll move forward, don't worry. Um, right, so let's take these lines L and M. And. Um, <clears throat> What I'm drawing here is two lines, um, cut, a line cutting L at right angles and a line cutting M at right angles, yeah? And since L and M don't have a third line at right angles to both of them, these two line segments must intersect somewhere, yeah? So you just let them intersect at a point Q. And you take P to be the point um, opposite Q across the line L, yeah? 
and R is the point opposite Q across the line M. And that length of QR is not necessarily the same as the length of QP. I know it looks like that in this picture, but it doesn't have to be. That's completely irrelevant to the proof. OK. Now, let us um, move on. We're trying to get a circle that goes through those three points, P, Q, and R. First of all, let's think of it this way. You take a circle through P and Q, which has its center, of course, necessarily on the line L. You take a, cent a circle through Q and R, which has its center on the line M. And you make these circles bigger until eventually you will get a circle that's a bigger than either of them, and it'll go through P, Q, and R. So the center, as you make these circles bigger, the center will move, the center of this one, of the top one, will move down the line L. The center of the bottom one will move along the line M. And when you've got a single circle that goes through the three points P, Q, and R, the center of the bottom one and the center of the top one will coincide because you'll have the same circle. Now, in this picture, they don't coincide because I never quite get that far because I'm, you know. But you, in principle, you've got a circle. You will get a circle through P, Q, and R, and its center will lie on L, and it will also lie on M. And therefore, L and M have a point in common. Proof. Proof of Euclid's fifth axiom. Now, you can wonder what's wrong with that, and uh, I'll ask you at the end. Okay. But we'll move on, because um, a great deal more work went into this question, and uh, one particular guy who was very, very, uh, very smart guy indeed, Johann Heinrich Lambert, um, he proved, anybody who's done circles, you know, the area of a circle is pi r squared and so on, he showed that pi cannot be... Okay, are we back again? Yes, sorry about that. I must have touched the button. button. Um, he proved that pi can never be written as a fraction. Many of you who went to school, uh, particularly old days, when you know, we used to deal with fractions a lot because we didn't have calculators, uh, used 22 over 7 as a good approximation for pi. There are better approximations. Um, 355 over 113. You try it on calculator. Pretty good. Okay, there's a way of getting these approximations. We won't go into that. Anyway, Lambert, um, now I've said here, he showed that area of triangle hyperbolic plane, he, he imagined that you had a plane that didn't satisfy Euclid's fifth axiom. And then he showed that the angles of the triangle um, would add up to less than 180 degrees. Um, we'll come back to that later. So, like Moses... He saw the promised land, but never entered it. Um, he died in 1777. Uh, and then I just want to mention another chap, um, Schweikart, who was a friend of Gauss. Now, we'll talk about Gauss in a minute, because he was, well, arguably the greatest mathematician since Newton, at any rate, and one of the three greatest of all time. Um, as I often say. Uh, actually, somebody once said to me, this is a funny story, uh, this was in America, this chap was a lawyer, and he said to me, tell me, why, who, who are the three greatest mathematicians of all time? And I sort of, you know, question out of the blue, I said, well, I don't know, I suppose um, Archimedes, Newton, and Gauss. Why do you guys always give the same answer to that question? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. So anyway, I think somebody wrote a book. He, he had quite fairly strong opinions, and that was his opinion. Um, but Archimedes and Newton were fantastic. They really were fantastic. But so was Gauss. Anyway, he wrote a letter to Gauss saying, this being assumed, whatever, you know, he made some assumptions about the existence of a plane that wasn't Euclidean, 
the sun, the angles in the triangle is less than 180 degrees. It becomes less as the area of the triangle becomes greater, and etc. Let me just talk about Gauss now. There's a nice, lovely picture of him, and there is the, uh, the statue to Gauss in Braunschweig. I've been there, I've seen the statue, and I've been around the back of the statue. And if you go on the back of the statue, you find there's a 17-point star. Because when Gauss was 19, he proved, well, he didn't just prove, he showed how you could construct a 17-gon, a regular 17-gon, a regular polygon with 17 sides. You may be... In, in school, you might have constructed a regular triangle. You can construct a regular pentagon with five sides. You can't construct a regular heptagon with seven sides. I was talking about prime numbers there. Cause, but anyway, uh, but you can do a regular 17 gone. The reason is that 17 is a power of 2 plus 1. It's a prime number, which is a power of 2 plus 1. There aren't many of those. But uh, anyway, uh, I digress. Um, this man, who, but one is just amazed at what Gauss did in his life, but at any rate, he discovered the hyperbolic plane. But he didn't publish it, because he knew that it wouldn't really be accepted, you know, and he'd be in an awful lot of controversy and everything else, so he intended that his pa these papers of his should be published after his death. So who did discover the hyperbolic plane? Well, let's go to Farkas Baloya, who was, this is a um, Hungarian mathematician, Baloya. He was a friend of Gauss's. They went to university together. Um, and he was, uh, unfortunately, very poorly paid, and he wrote and published dramas um, while he worked on his mathematical masterpiece. He tried to dissuade his son from um, ever going into... Uh, the study of the um, Euclid's fifth axiom. And he said, um, detest it as lewd intercourse. It can deprive you of all your leisure, your health, your rest, and the whole happiness of your life. Um, but uh, Janosch Bolyai persisted in working on the fifth. Uh, Farkas Balio, there are lots of lovely quotes. I mean, he was, this is a man who wrote plays and so on. I mean, he was perfectly capable uh, of, of writing and, and writing very elegantly. Um, and uh, I'm not sure I have the, the quote, particular quote here, but uh, he said, I, I've, I've been on this journey before and I've always come back with a broken mast and torn sail. You know, so don't, don't go there. But Janos, um, Janos Bolyai, uh, this picture of him is on a Romanian postage stamp. Uh, we don't have a picture of Bolyai, Janos Bolyai. I, I know it seems incredible, but we don't. We have a picture of Everest Galwa, who died much younger because a friend of his sketched his portrait in school, but nobody ever gave it. This is a, a, perhaps an invented picture. Um, he wasn't Romanian, he was Hungarian, but the town he was born in is now part of Romania. And he said... Um, I am resolved to publish a work on parallels as soon as I can put it in order, complete it, and the opportunity arise. I have not yet made good the discovery, but the path I followed, etc., etc. Um, and his father said, well, this is brilliant stuff, actually. We must publish it immediately. And since his father was, um, uh, was publishing a book, he could easily slot his... Um, his son's work into an appendix of 24 pages at the end of the book, which he did. And one historian of science, I um, can't remember his name, a uh, very famous historian of science anyway, um, said he considered this as the 24 greatest pages ever written. Or something. You know, it was really incredible stuff. And he never published again. Can you believe it? You see... It's really, it's really sad what happened uh, with this. I mean, you'd expect, look, this man did this incredible work. He would be offered chairs here and there and everywhere. His father sent the thing to Gauss, but Gauss was a, 
a slightly, um, well, he was, a, he was not an outgoing, enthusiastic, what a brilliant thing this is, kind of chap. He, what he wrote back was, and this was read to Janosch, who took it badly, if I commenced by saying that I am unable to praise this work, you would certainly be surprised for a moment. This he wrote back to Farkas Bolyai. Indeed, the whole contents of the work, the path taken by your son, the results to which he's led, coincide almost entirely with my meditations, which have occupied my mind partly for the last 30 or 35 years, and so on and so forth. So Janosch just felt, you know, I did all this stuff, and it's already been done. I mean, he was really despondent, and he just, he never, never recovered. Um, very, very sad. But, you see, all this was in the air. I, I mentioned Schweikert, I mentioned Lambert, and so on. This was sort of in the air. And Nikolai Lobachevsky, a Russian, um, also discovered this hyperbolic geometry independently. Um, and he had no better fortune. I mean, he became head of his university, and they got rid of him. I, I mean, it is quite incredible, almost as if there was a curse on this, you know. It's like the assassination of the Kennedys. It's, it's, it's a sort of cursed thing. And you, you, you can't win. You just sort of mustn't do anything um, here at all. Anyway, um, but I don't believe in curses. You know, I was in Egypt recently, and they tell you this big story about how <laughs> Howard Carter discovered Tutankhamun's tomb, and all the workmen who worked in it all disappeared, and so on. And then cursed. I, I don't know. I don't really buy this. Anyway, let me go on to uh, go back to Sakheri's triangles. I remember once, um, and I'm saying this to people who may not know these things, mathematics students, I didn't know this stuff when I was a student, not even as a graduate student. And a, a very famous mathematician came to Chicago and gave a talk on hyperbolic, on the hyperbolic plane and said that the area of a triangle was proportional to 180 degrees minus the sum of the angles of the triangle. I was absolutely mind-boggling. I thought it was mind-boggling, that. Absolutely incredible. I mean, even if you send those, those corners of the triangle out to infinity, you'll still only get the triangle being a certain size. That's why we tend to draw them with curved, with sort of concave lines like that. Okay. So what's the difference between the Euclidean plane and the uh, hyperbolic plane? Well, in the Euclidean plane, if you have a point... I've, I've sort of condensed the whole Euclidean plane into a disk here. And I've taken a point on the boundary of the disk, in other words, a point out at infinity. And I've taken all the lines that go to that point at infinity. So if that's the North Pole, these are all the lines that are going north. Huh? The direction is north. And they all end up at the sort of North Pole at infinity. And at the other end, they end up, so to speak, at the South Pole at infinity. <coughs> Hyperbolic plane is quite different. There, there are lines emanating from the same point, and they end up... These are straight lines. I know they look curved on this. Straight lines, and they end up all over the place, anywhere around the boundary. This is called the Poincaré disk model of the hyperbolic plane, and I'm just sort of really mentioning this, perhaps, for mathematics students. Um, it's a very interesting model of the hyperbolic plane where the lines are... Um, Oh, that's funny. It didn't... Uh... Yeah. The lines, uh, if they go through the centre, the straight lines look like straight lines. If they don't go through the centre, they look like curved lines. But they are curved lines, which are arcs of circles that meet the boundary at 90 degrees. Here are a few examples. This is, the hyper this is the, a wonderful representation of the hyperbolic plane. And whenever lines cross, the angle at which they cross is always exactly the same as the angle they should cross at in the hyperbolic plane. It's a very useful, um, very useful thing in this Poincaré disk model. But I must, uh, I must finish now. Uh, there's another model called the upper half plane model. I think I'll just skip that, actually. Um, what goes on in the hyperbolic plane, the reason the lines don't meet is here are the two lines, L and M, crossing um, a third line at angles alpha and beta, which add up to less than 180. But you see, they sort of drift off and go off to infinity, completely different ways. So what was wrong with my proof? Anybody know? 
Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, actually, well done. Congratulations. I think you've hit the nail on the head there. It is exactly that point that any three lines lie on a straight line or a circle. And what I did was I gave you a very sort of hand-wavy proof. Well, you see, you make the circle bigger and bigger and bigger, yeah? And there's a limit, you see. What happens if I take the model of the hyperbolic plane given us by Poincaré, the Poincaré disk model? Here are the three points in blue. There's a line going through two of them. And you can, I haven't got all the circles on there because the, the, the picture would just get too messy. I've got the biggest circle you can get that goes through those two points, yeah? the two lower points there. The biggest circle, because it goes right out to infinity. Its center is out at infinity, believe it or not. And the circle, so to speak, goes through infinity as well. That's the biggest, and it never hits that third point. So that was a hand-wavy proof. But, you know, people did this kind of thing in geometry at one time. And they would get to some conclusion like that, and then they would use that to sort of leapfrog onto showing that the fifth axiom was a consequence of the other four. And the leapfrogging was fine. What was wrong was their, their starting position that they, that they uh, managed to get to. It was just nonsense. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop there, actually, because I've, I've got through my talk with enough time for questions, I think. Um, so we have about 10 minutes for questions, if anybody would like to. Um, right. Do we have any questions? <laughs> Yes, okay. we have one. Yes. Yes. You said it's only coincidence that that point's in the middle. But it seems to me, I'd, how can it avoid being in the middle? Oh, well, let's just run back to that very quickly. Um, and we'll, we'll see what you, uh, what you, mean. you mean. You mean this thing, yeah? That picture. Q, well, what I said was... Um, that the length of the line PQ is not necessarily the same as the length of the line QR. You've got one line, you've got another line, they will hit, they will meet. Okay? There's no question. I mean, that, that point Q, um, if, if that point Q could be... If you, shifted, if you shifted this line over slightly to the right, then Q would be closer to the line L than it is to the line M. But when the chap who drew these pictures for me, drew it, he did actually make them, I think, pretty much the same length. But that's just, you know, yeah. But it, I, I was very grateful to him for drawing the pictures because I can't draw these pictures on a, on a computer. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I came in slightly late, so I may have missed something. But Yeah, um, you missed Alexander the Great. That's what you missed. All ah, right, yeah. Yeah, I was almost um, going to go back to that and get a question on it, but go ahead, yeah. Nothing to do with Alexander the Great. Um, I sort of get the feeling that somehow... This is sort of cheating a bit because yeah. surely when Euclid was doing his geometry, he would have assumed that you were talking about what we call a plane, which is a flat exactly. plane. Is there nothing in his assumptions that, that sort of relate to that flatness, or is it just yes, the sort of... Yes, it's the fifth axiom. It really is the right. fifth axiom. And is that fifth axiom, which... He, I mean, I think this, Euclid was a brilliant guy. I mean, he just you know, got it down to what he needed, nothing more than he needed. And the first four axioms are all sort of things that, you know, you've got to start somewhere and you need them. And the fifth axiom, he really needed it. So that's what makes it flat. And there's nothing wrong with the fifth, fifth axiom. You know, it's very useful for um, architects and all sorts of people. And, of course, nowadays, I don't know if you keep in touch with what goes on in physics. I mean, I try to, but, you know, they talk about dark matter and uh, expanding universes and all of that stuff. Um, what would happen if you made a triangle in the universe with the points millions of light years apart? Would the angles add up to about 180 degrees? Or, or wouldn't they? And uh, the latest thing I read, probably in The Economist or something, so you, know, you don't know, but it said that actually they would. That's the latest. So I don't know. We don't know, really, um, for the universe. Um, and of course, on the Earth, uh, it's not true because the Earth is curved. But in the, in the ideal flat plane, which, which uh, Euclid was dealing with, yeah, it's absolutely true. Um, 
And uh, yeah, sorry. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, we should go back to Alexander, oh, Alexander the Great. Yes. Uh, so, so was this was the hyperbolic plane? Was that the time? Was that the moment that people realised that you could have a geometry that wasn't yes. what we think of as kind of our kind of yes. normal spatial geometry. So they didn't have that idea before they had the example of the... You re that's the right. Thing. That's a very good point. You needed the example. I mean, otherwise, the whole thing is a bit sort of airy-fairy. If this happens, then that happens, and the angles of a triangle would be less than 180 degrees and so on. But can this happen? Because if it can't, then forget it. So you needed an example this example, it had to be constructed, and that was the great work that uh, Janusz Boliai did. Um, of course, once that's been done, once that, the ice has been broken, then people can start discussing other sorts of geometry where things aren't flat. Huh? They can do not just two-dimensional geometry, but three-dimensional geometry. And a man called Bernard Riemann in Germany um, devised a sort of multi-dimensional geometry where you could have curvature that would be intrinsic to the geometry. It wouldn't be curved in some bigger flat space. It would be intrinsic to the geometry. And that, of course, was absolutely vitally important to Einstein when he did his theory of relativity. Sorry, I've moved away from here, and I'm not supposed to, I know. Um, when he did his theory of relativity, because in special relativity, space-time is flat. And there, there are, there's a sort of glitch in special relativity. Not the right time to go into it, but you know you have to take account of acceleration. You have to take account of gravity. And once he did that, he needed to curve space-time. And it was all this Riemannian geometry that got used. These ideas that got used by Einstein in the general theory of relativity. So this was absolutely vital for the development, not just of mathematics, but of science, of physics. Thank you. Amazing. Any more questions? Yes, we have one over yeah. here. Look, at, at what point and this version was replaced by the new one? And Which version? This version of Euclid. No, axiom. we still have Euclidean geometry. Yeah. We have Euclidean geometry. It's very, very useful. Um, students in school learn it. And um, if you go to a good school, they, they prove theorems and so on and so forth. Uh, hyperbolic geometry, people don't tend to learn about. It's just a bit more difficult to, to deal with. Um, but it is extremely useful in mathematics. Um, and operating in the hyperbolic plane has a completely different symmetry from operating in the Euclidean plane. And it gets used in the study of symmetry in, in a way that I that I won't go into here, but yeah. both of them are, are useful. I understand that, but usually the fifth axiom is a new, has got a new version that there is only one parallel outside. Well, that's Euclidean geometry, where the plane is flat, and these lines don't meet, and you've just got a unique parallel line. Yeah. There's another way of stating that. It's called Playfair's axiom. If you've got a line, this is Playfair's axiom, but it's equivalent to Euclid's fifth yes. axiom. If you've got a line and you've got a point not on that line, there is a unique line through that other point that doesn't meet this line. Yeah, that was my yeah, question. Yeah. When these two were proved to be equivalent and... Ah, yeah, well, that was Playfair. Playfair. I guess Playfair proved that this was equivalent to Euclid's fifth axiom. There are other ways. I mean, that business that I said about three points lying a straight line or a circle, if you took that as an axiom, it's equivalent to Euclid's fifth axiom. You can prove one, you, you know, you can go both ways with the proof. Well, thank you very much. I think we haven't any more time for questions. Oh, wait a minute, we've got one more here. Um. <laughs> go on, yeah. So if it's very, very quick and a very quick answer. Yes, I don't know. Uh, don't ask me about that. That's a very tricky one. I would have thought that the universe sort of curves around on itself and just expands like a balloon expands, and I agree. But it could just be sort of generally flat and expanding. So I don't know. I, I think we don't actually know the answer. 
to that question. Well, the, a nice um, end to the lecture, a bit of uncertainty which um, inhabits mathematics. And yes. um, thank you very much, uh, Mark. Thank you.